it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker within the Greek series, uh, Professor Eugene Ferraponta from Loughborough University. Uh, on the satisfied by modular forms. So please, Jenya. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak about our joint recent work with Stanislav Panasenko. <clears throat> so what this all about, uh, this is all about. So you know that many uh, well-known special functions of mathematical physics, uh, such as hypergeometric functions, Penlevy transcendence, elliptic functions, they satisfy simple differential equations, algebraic differential equations. Uh, and modular forms, although they are mainly uh, an object of number theory, uh, algebraic geometry, uh, but they can be also viewed as special functions of mathematical physics to some extent. They're appearing in many different contexts in string theory, mirror symmetry, theory of integrable systems, they also satisfy relatively simple algebraic differential equations, although they are quite sophisticated uh, non-trivial objects. So, and, uh, so I will discuss differential equations satisfied by modular forms. So this is the plan of my talk. I will start with classical modular forms, Eisenstein series and uh, Ramanujan equations satisfied by this Eisenstein series. Uh, okay, and then I will discuss third order ordinary differential equations and fourth order or ODEs for modular forms and give you uh, a few examples of explicit uh, examples of differential equations for modular forms. Then if time permits, I will speak about Jacobi forms, two variable uh, uh, generalizations of modular forms and more or less uh, do the same, discuss differential systems for Jacobi forms and give some examples. So it's based on our paper with Stanislav Apanasenko, which is available on the archive. All right, so uh, let me start with a general picture before I proceed to actually to the topic. Uh, uh, a general picture, uh, um, in this uh, general picture, nothing is actually proved, but uh, this is what it should be in general. Uh, so, I will not be very precise. So here, let F, uh, F be a, a modular form of some kind. A modular, classical modular form uh, is a function of one variable which belongs to the upper half plane. So F of tau, where tau is in the upper half plane. Or a modular form of several variables, uh, Jacobi form, Ziegel modular form, Picard modular form, anything, right? Uh, then, uh, uh, and uh, let this modular form be defined on a discrete subgroup gamma of some Lie group, capital G. Then there is a system of uh, uh, ODs or PDs for this, uh, uh, that this fun modular form satisfies. And this system sigma has the following properties. First of all, this, this system is involutive, so means compatible, right? So everybody knows what involutive is. Uh, then uh, this system is of finite type. It means uh, it has finite dimensional solution space. Uh, 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 so uh, then uh, this, sig uh, this system is G invariant. So uh, this uh, original modular form F is invariant under a discrete subgroup gamma of any group but the system sigma is invariant under the full Lie group. Uh, and uh, furthermore, this uh, group capital G acts on the solution space of the system with an open orbit. So it's, it acts in a locally uh, uh, transitive way. Uh, so in particular dimension of uh, the solution space of this system is equal to the dimension of the Lie group G. Um, and uh, 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 system sigma is expressible via algebraic relations among differential invariants of the group G, right? Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, so, and the mod so, and the modular form, original modular form F is a generic solution of this system. So in other words, it belongs to the open orbit. Uh, since uh, uh, the group G uh, uh, acts on this open orbit and uh, the function F has a discrete stabilizer gamma, so this action 
uh, uh, the action of G on the open orbit has a discrete stabilizer. So this is the general picture. This is not proved for general modular forms, but it should be, in my opinion, this should be true. And I will discuss a very simple instance of this general picture where we have a classical modular form, uh, F of tau, tau belongs to the upper half plane H, upper half plane. Uh, so in this case, a discrete group is just SL to Z. The Lie group G is SL to R. And the system sigma for this modular form is just a third order nonlinear differential equation, just a single differential equation for this function, which has SL to R invariance. In particular, this system sigma is expressed in terms of differential invariance of a suitable action of SL to R. All right, so let's check all the properties, all these bullet points. So uh, system sigma must be involutive. So in this case, it's just a single OD. Okay, of course, it's involutive uh, uh, automatically, right? There is nothing incompatible in one, one single OD. <laughs> then system sigma is of finite type. Of course, uh, dimension of solution space uh, of a third order OD is three, right? So it's a three, it has three dimensional solution space. Furthermore, the group SL, uh, SL2R acts on the solution space of this ODE um, uh, with an open orbit. So the dimension of the open orbit is three and it, it equals dimension, the dimension of the group. Um, and the modular form is a solution. It belongs to uh, this open orbit. Okay, and this is what I'm going to discuss in my talk. This, um, what is shown here in red. And maybe if time permits, I will uh, discuss generalization of this uh, to uh, Jacobi, Jacobi forms. Uh, um, okay, I'm not assuming uh, uh, familiarity with modular forms. So let me give a brief definition, a uh, quick definition. So what is a modular form? on a discrete subgroup of SL2R. It's a holomorphic function f of tau on the upper half plane that satisfies the following transformation property. So you know that uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, this matrix A, B, C, D, it, it belongs to SL2Z, to uh, SL2Z. Uh, in fact, uh, even if it belongs to SL2R, to this, uh, this linear fractional action preserves uh, the upper half plane, all right? So, but in our case, A, B, C, D belong to a cell to R or in general, a discrete subgroup uh, of, uh, uh, so A, B, C, D belongs to a cell to Z or in more generally to a discrete subgroup of a cell to R, all right? Here, K, this integer is called the weight of the modular form. So this is the definition, a function holomorphic on the upper half plane and satisfying this property, this transformation rule for any matrix, say, from a discrete subgroup of SL to R, all right? And in most of the examples, uh, uh, this group gamma uh, will be the so-called Hecke congruence uh, subgroup of SL to Z of level N, which is denoted gamma zero of N, and it's a group of matrices, two by two matrices with integer entries such that, uh, first of all, the matrix belongs to SL to Z. So AD minus BC equals one. And furthermore, this C is divisible by N. So C is congruent to zero mod N. So this group is called uh, gamma zero of N or Hecke congruence subgroup. In particular, uh, for n equals one, gamma zero one is just SL to Z itself, all right? So, okay, uh, let me show uh, uh, some examples. Uh, uh, standard examples of modular forms are the so-called Eisenstein series. So E, K of tau, uh, K is for the weight, right? E, K has weight K. It's one minus two K over BK. BK is the Bernoulli number. K is Bernoulli number. Bernoulli numbers are just uh, Taylor coefficients of the expansion of the following function, 
x over e to the x minus one. So it's Taylor coefficients are Bernoulli numbers, right? And then we have this uh, uh, function sigma k minus one of n. What is sigma k minus one of n? It's uh, the sum of divisors of n, the sum of all divisors of n to the power k minus one, all right? Uh, so uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I say divisors of n, so we count one as a divisor, we count n itself as a divisor. So you take all possible divisors of n and raise them to the power, to the power k minus one, and you sum of all divisors of n. Right, this is sigma k minus one of n. And you multiply this by q to the n, where q is this thing, e to the two pi i tau. Tau is from the upper half plane. So this is the standard Eisenstein series. All right, so let me show you the first three, because uh, they will feature in uh, some equations later. So e2 of tau is this thing, all right? Uh, by the way, e2 is not a modular form. It's, it's quasi-modular. Its transformation rule is slightly different, but we need it still. We need this e2 of tau. But e4 and e6, they're proper modular forms. e4 is of weight four, e6 is of weight six, all right? And these are the expansions. So what is sigma one of n? sum of divisors of n to the power of one. So just sum of divisors, sum of the cubes of divisors, sum of the fifth powers of divisors of n. And so, right? Uh, so these are standard uh, uh, modular forms. Uh, and let me show you uh, differential equations that these forms satisfy. So my goal will be to derive differential equations individually for each of these Eisenstein series, all right? Uh, in fact, they are known. In, in this particular case, it's known. In fact, my talk is mainly, uh, how to say, I would say uh, 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 it doesn't have much originality, I would say. It's just a summary of what is known about modular forms. Uh, uh, so, okay. Uh, so, uh, the Eisenstein series E2, E4, and E6, they satisfy these three very simple ODEs with quadratic right-hand sides, right? Very simple differential equations. Here, prime, prime denotes uh, this operator, either Q d by dQ, or it's the same one over two pi i d by d tau. Remember that tau is a, a coordinate on the upper half plane, and q equals e to the two pi i tau, right? So it's convenient to scale the derivative to avoid uh, uh, all these uh, multiples of pi's on the right-hand sides. So in this case, coefficients on the right-hand side are all rational numbers, right? So we have these uh, Ramanujan equations. Uh, uh, no, the first, uh, it's, it's also well known that uh, these equations are invariant under the group SL2R, which acts as written here. Tau is transformed in a linear fractional way. E2 tra is transformed. This bit, the first bit, is uh, as if it is a modular form of weight two. But then there is this additional term which makes it actually quasi-modular form. So it's not a modular form because this is how it transforms. Uh, but uh, 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 E4 and E6, they transform as modular forms, right? So uh, this system of differential equations is invariant under this SL2R action, right? Uh, now, uh, what can we say? Uh, uh, now, what is the structure of modular forms on the discrete subgroup uh, on SL2Z? So there is a theorem that every modular form on SL2Z is a homogeneous polynomial in E4 and E6. What means homogeneous? The total weight of the polynomial must be the same, All right? So uh, for instance, uh, E4 cubed, has weight 12 and E6 squared has also weight 12. So A E4 cubed plus B 
E6 squared is a homogeneous polynomial of weight 12, right? So this means homogeneous. Uh, so every modular form is a homogeneous polynomial in these two, all right? Okay, let's uh, write this expansion uh, expression for F in terms of E4 and E6. And let's differentiate uh, uh, this expression using the above Ramanujan equations. So we can calculate, uh, we know F as a polynomial in E4 and E6. We calculate F prime, F double prime, F triple prime. Right, uh, all these derivatives, all these four functions will be expressed in terms of E2, E4, and E6. In fact, F is expressed in terms of E4, E6 only, but when we differentiate, E2 will appear because you see it appears here on the right hand side. <clears throat> but anyway, so we have four functions expressed in terms of these three expressions, right? So we can eliminate E2, E4, and E6 and end up with a single differential equation, a single relation connecting these four functions. This will be the required third order ordinary differential equation for F. And since equations for E2, E4, and D6 are uh, SL2 R invariant, right? Uh, this invariance will be inherited uh, 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 by the equation, by the third order equation. So it will also be SL2 R invariant. But in what follows, I will not use this recipe. We will uh, <clears throat> do it slightly differently. Okay, uh, so let me uh, 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 show you one example. Uh, uh, example, uh, 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 the uh, ODE for the so-called modular discriminant. Modular discriminant is a uh, form, uh, modular form of weight 12. And it's defined by this expression, E4 cubed minus E6 squared, right? Uh, uh, I divide by this uh, number to make the first coefficient equal to one, right? It's standard, right? So this is called the modular discriminant. And this is the expansion of modular discriminant. It's Q times the product minus one minus Q to the n to the power 24, right? So, uh, uh, I say that uh, modular discriminant is a cusp form. What does it mean cusp form? Uh, cusp form means that uh, expansion, Q expansion of this uh, delta starts with Q. It doesn't have free term. If you remember expansions for E2, E4, and E6, they were starting with one, right? So uh, uh, this is not a cusp form. They are not cusp forms. And delta is a cusp form. It's, its expansion starts with Q. It means that when you go to infinity along the y-axis on the upper half plane, delta tends to zero. So modular forms which tend to zero as you approach infinity along the y-axis, it's you go you go up along the y-axis, along the imaginary axis. Uh, if the if a modular form tends to zero, it's called a cusp form. So delta is the smallest weight cusp form on SL2Z. It has weight 12. All right, so it satisfies the following three, the, the following two differential equations. This is a third order differential equation. Okay, it doesn't look very pretty, I would say, but what is good about it? Uh, uh, it's uh, algebraic and the derivatives and coefficients are integers, all right? Uh, by the way, it's not quasi-linear. The top derivative comes in uh, the second power. Delta triple prime square, right? This uh, equation is well known. It was obtained by Reznikov. Uh, and uh, okay, there is a simpler fourth, uh, and uh, yeah, and this equation is SL2R invariant. If you calculate its point symmetry group, you get SL2R, right? And this SL2R acts on the solution space of this ODE uh, with an open orbit. Uh, in a locally free way. But uh, uh, the same function <clears throat> also satisfies a, another, a fourth order ODE, which is written here. This time, it's also, by the way, this all, uh, also, it, it's algebraic and the derivatives, coefficients are also integers, and this time uh, it's quasi-linear. So it's linear in the top derivative, linear in the top derivative. Um, and this equation, is invariant under GL2R. 
So it has an extra scaling symmetry. Uh, so you can see that each term uh, in this uh, fourth order equation is of degree four in delta, right? So delta cubed times delta four prime. So if, uh, uh, and here delta squared, delta delta, delta squared, delta squared, and so on. So each term has, of deg has degree four in delta or its derivatives, uh, I mean, algebraic degree. And therefore, if you scale delta by some coefficient, uh, the equation doesn't change. So you have an extra scaling symmetry in this equation, right? Delta goes to lambda delta. And there is no scaling symmetry in the above equation and the third order equation. You see, all these terms, all these terms are, in, uh, are of, of degree six, uh, algebraic degree six in delta, but the last one has degree seven. So this equation is not invariant on the scaling of delta, but this is, and in fact, this is more, kind of more well-known. This is called Van der Poel Rankin equation, also obtained long ago, right? By the way, this fourth order equation for the modular discriminant is a differential corollary of this third order equation in the following sense. If you take this third order equation and if you just differentiate it, directly differentiate it by tau, apply another prime, then of course you get a quasi-linear fourth order equation, but it will not be gl 2 r invariant. You have to somehow play with them a little bit to construct something gl 2 r invariant. And this is precisely the thing which you obtain if you take this equation, its derivative, and you play with them. And then you can construct something gl 2 r invariant. Okay, this is what I'm going to, to do for other modular forms, to present a third order uh, differential equation and a fourth order differential equation, SL to R invariant and GL to R invariant equation. And they expressed in terms of differential invariance of the group. So let me move on to the general construction. Ah, before, actually, before I move to the general construction, uh, let me remind you the so-called modularity theory. So what this is about. Uh, uh, so you know that, uh, for instance, elliptic curve uh, of the form y squared equals uh, 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3 can be parameterized by elliptic functions. So for y, you take a p, uh, p prime, and for x, you take p. p prime squared is 4p cubed minus g2p minus g3. So it's well known that uh, elliptic curve can be uniformized by elliptic uh, functions. But uh, uh, it's also well known in number theory that uh, every elliptic curve with uh, rational co coefficients can be parameterized by modular forms, right? Maybe it's slightly less known and uh, less well known in mathematical physics. Mathematical physicists parameterize elliptic curves by elliptic functions. But also the elliptic curves can be parameterized by modular forms. So <clears throat> uh, let's take an elliptic curve gamma with rational coefficients. Uh, what does it mean that uh, it possesses a modular parameterization? It means that there is uh, um, a map from factor of upper half plane by some congruence subgroup of level M, there is a, a rational map from this to gamma. And this is a, a also a, a curve. It's also a curve of, of the genus, which depends on M, which depends on M. So why I'm putting, why I'm writing here N big or equal to 11, because if N is less than or equal to 11, then this factor always has genus zero. So you cannot cover elliptic curve, right? To make this thing cover an elliptic curve, a curve of genus one, you must have n big or equal to 11. I'll show you an example in a second. <coughs> and uh, okay, uh, so there is a rational map from uh, this thing to our curve gamma, such that the pullback of holomorphic differential from gamma. So gamma is an elliptic curve. So it has a holomorphic differential. 
So we can take a holomorphic differential here and pull it back to this factor. Then this pullback must be, uh, uh, can be represented in the form. Okay, pi i is just a standard multiple, uh, uh, f of tau d tau, where f of tau is a cusp form of weight two on this discrete subgroup, right? This is what it means that uh, a Russian, uh, an elliptic curve possess a module, possesses a modular parameterization. So let me repeat. There is a rational map from this factor to our curve. In fact, this rational map is expressed in terms of this modular form f of tau. <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, uh, there is this map such that the pullback of holomorphic differential from here to this factor is expressible in this form where f of tau is a cusp form, is a modular form of weight two on this congruous subgroup. A modular form with integer coefficients. So it's Q expansion has integer coefficients. In fact, this is the famous uh, Taniyama Shimura Weil conjecture, which was proved by Weils. And then uh, by, uh, uh, it was proved by Weils and Taylor for semi stable curves. And then by, uh, okay, students of Wiles and his collaborators in full generality in 2001. <clears throat> For instance, <clears throat> if you take this particular elliptic curve with integer coefficients, uh, it's, uh, by the way, it's J invariant is this thing, is this thing, it's the J invariant of this curve. This thing, uh, this, uh, this expression will appear later. Uh, so I'm writing it here. So this curve is an elliptic curve with the following value of J invariant. Uh, by the way, there is a program in Maple uh, which gives you a J invariant immediately. If you type the curve, it gives you J invariant, right? So this is what it will give you, right? <clears throat> and this particular curve gamma, so this is our gamma, this, this curve. Uh, it possesses uh, uh, a parameterization, uh, a modular parameterization uh, where n is 11. So it, it, it possesses a parameterization, uh, um, uh, it possesses a covering map from h factored by gamma zero of 11. And the pullback of holomorphic differential here to H, oops, sorry, uh, to H will be this modular form. It's a, a way to modular form on gamma zero of 11. And by the way, if you expand this in Q, you will see that this series has integer coefficients. Integer coefficients, uh, uh, remember I said, uh, cusp form of way two with integer coefficients. Right, what does it mean cusp form? Cusp form means it starts with Q. There is no free term and it's a Q expansion. So you see it starts with Q. It has integer coefficients, right? Clearly this has integer coefficients. It's defined, it's a modular form of weight two on gamma zero of 11. And it's the pullback of this uh, uh, differential. I will show you how to explicitly construct this map from gamma zero, from H factor by gamma zero of 11 to gamma, to this curve gamma, explicitly in terms of this function at the end of my talk. <clears throat> so in fact, what we will see is that if we write differential equation, third order differential equation for this modular form, we'll, we will somehow recover this form, right? The, sorry, we will recover this elliptic curve. In other words, differential equation for F knows the corresponding elliptic curve. Okay, uh, so let me move on. Uh, okay, uh, uh, now it's just, I'll, I'll say a few words about Fermat's last theorem. Uh, so uh, it's the most spectacular application of the modularity theorem proved by Wiles and Taylor. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, suppose that there is a solution to Fermat's equation. So A, B, C are integers, P is greater than or greater or equal to three, 
right? Suppose there is a non-trivial solution uh, to uh, Fermat's equation. Then let's introduce the following elliptic curve. So A and B are precisely this A and B, All right? So let's introduce the following elliptic curve. Then it was realized long, uh, uh, so before actually Wiles proved his modularity theorem, it was realized, uh, it was uh, 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 proved by uh, 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 Ribeck in 1990, that this curve is not modular. It can't be modular. If A, B, and C satisfy this equation, then this curve cannot be modular, All right? So, but modularity theorem says that every uh, elliptic curve with integer coefficients is modular. So this is a contradiction and it says, uh, it, it proves that there are no such integers, right? So it follows from modularity theorem straight away. Okay, <clears throat> now let me, uh, 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 now the structure of third order ODE is for modular forms. Okay, suppose we have a modular form f of tau of weight k. Then the corresponding third order ODE, I said it's SL to R invariant. So therefore it must be expressible in terms of the invariance of SL to R. So these invariants are shown here. This is IK, it's a second order invariant. You see, it depends on k. This is the second order invariant. And this is jk, is the third order invariant. Right, this is SL to R invariant. So every SL to R invariant OD is an algebraic, is an expression of this form. It's an expression connecting uh, these two invariants. Uh, what is important for modular forms this equation must be an algebraic relation, All right? So it's a polynomial of i k and j k, some polynomial of i k and j k. So every modular form f of tau weight k satisfy, satisfies an, a, a, a relation of this kind. And this relation obviously is an ODE of third order because you see we have f triple prime here. Uh, <clears throat> so it's an ODE, third order ODE. Uh, therefore, for every modular form f of tau weight k, we associate in a certain canonical way as an algebraic curve, right? An algebraic curve. Uh, and uh, okay, we can say that this modular form provides a modular parameterization of this algebraic curve, right? Because i k and j k are expressed in terms of this f in this explicit way and this explicit way. So this algebraic curve is parameterized by modular form f of tau. So it's another way of looking at this. So he expressed uh, the invariance i k and j k in terms of the so-called ranking coin brackets. But uh, uh, I let me skip this because I don't have formulas for ranking coin brackets. These are certain SL to R invariant expressions. In fact, uh, uh, it proves uh, uh, that these are invariants, right? That these are invariants. And also the expression, the existence of expressions in terms of the ranking current brackets guarantees that there is an algebraic relation uh, connecting i, k, and j, k. Uh, so what can we say about the general solution to this ODE? First of all, f of tau is a solution, but uh, every other generic solution is of this form. It's written here. So f is this our given uh, modular form. And the generic solution to this ODE is this, f of a tau plus b c tau plus d plus d divided by c tau plus d to the power k. k is the weight, where in this formula, a, b, c, d belong to uh, uh, it's a matrix from SL to R, right? It's a group action. In fact, this IK and JK are invariants of this group action, all right? Uh, uh, by the way, uh, differential equations for modular forms sometimes possess non-generic solutions. So here, what is written here is a generic solution. It's expressed in terms of the modular form just by 
uh, rescaling argument and the module form itself. Uh, but uh, uh, there are non there may be non-generic algebraic solutions, which may also be of interest. I'm, I will show you an example later. Okay, this is the structure of a third order ODI for modular forms. Uh, now, what is so special uh, about weight two? Uh, remember I said that for, uh, uh, um, for uh, elliptic curves, Every elliptic curve with rational coefficients can be parameterized by weight two modular forms. So what is special about k equals two? You see, <clears throat> if f is a modular form, then this numerator is also a modular form because it's expressed in terms of the ranking Cohen bracket. But this denominator isn't because we have this term four over k, all right? F is a modular form, f squared is a modular form. But f to the power four over k is not because we have uh, division by k. But when, oops, sorry. But when k is two, this becomes an integer. We'll have here f to the power four and everything here becomes a modular function, right? So everything here becomes modular. In general, this expression is not modular if k is not equal to two or not divisible by four, right? Uh, sorry if four over k is not an integer, sorry. Uh, all right, uh, same here. When k is, uh, when k is uh, two, six over two is an integer and we have f to the six, it's a modular form. So both top and bottom of this formula become modular forms. So their ratio is a modular function. It has nice transformation properties. So this is what makes k equals two special. And this is shown on the next slide. So next slide is about weight two. So suppose now that k is two, then we have i2 and j2. I wrote here the expressions from the previous page when k is two. So i2 is this, j2 is this. And you see here, both top and bottom in both expressions are modular forms themselves. So when you divide them, you get a modular function. Uh, it's well known, it's a result of Hurwitz that two modular functions on a, uh, uh, two uh, meromorphic, so this is a meromorphic, uh, these are meromorphic functions. Two meromorphic functions on a, on a Riemann surface algebraically dependent. This is where this relation comes from. This are, you see, I2 and J2 are modular functions and they are algebraically dependent. Uh, uh, so there is a relation, algebraic relation of this kind. And by the way, <coughs> it's a, a simple, Straightforward calculation. If I2 and J2 are defined by this formula, then uh, by this formulas, then you can compute Di2 divided by J2. And if you do a simple calculation, you don't need to use any property of modular forms, just these two equations, uh, right? Then Di2 over J2 is pi i f of tau d tau. So it's a direct calculation. And so we will see in examples that for a curve, for an algebraic curve of this form, di2 over j2, it's a holomorphic, uh, uh, for elliptic curves of this kind, di2 over j2 is a holomorphic differential on this curve. And we kind of get this, you see, pre-image, pre-image of a holomorphic differential on this curve is our modular form, f of tau d tau, right? Uh, okay, now let me uh, uh, say a few words about um, fourth order differential equations for modular forms. <clears throat> so uh, it's very similar. Every modular form of weight K satisfies a fourth order ordinary differential equation, which is expressed in this form, in this form, where PK and QK are GL to R invariants. And they're shown here. This is PK. It's third order. You see F triple prime here appears, right? It's a third order invariant, differential invariant. And this is QK is a fourth order differential invariant. You see we have fourth order derivative here. Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, so yeah, now what's the difference? from the previous case. 
You see in this picture, both top and bottom are modular forms for any F, right? For any modular form F, both top expression and bottom expression are modular forms. Same here for QK. This expression and this expression are also modular forms. So both PK and QK are always modular functions. We don't need to restrict to K equals two in this case, for any K, right? And therefore, uh, by the same Hurwitz theorem, PK and QK must satisfy an algebraic relation. Uh, so uh, uh, this gives another algebraic curve naturally associated to any modular form. So the previous uh, uh, a third order equation gives you one curve and uh, uh, f of i k j k equals zero. And a fourth order equation gives you another curve, f of p k q k is zero. Uh, so, and by the way, uh, 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 yeah, uh, this, by the way, this differential equation is a differential consequence of the previous differential equation of the third or the differential equation. It's easy to show in general. Uh, and the general solution to this differential equation uh, is uh, given by exactly the same formula as before, but this time, the matrix A, B, C, D is not restricted to belong to SL2R. It belongs to GL2R. So AD minus BC is not necessarily equal to R, right? So this is a generic solution to this OD, right? So by the way, uh, this curve, uh, the curve, uh, so uh, uh, let me summarize. Suppose we are given a modular form of weight K. Then there is a, uh, third order OD satisfied by this modular form. And it corresponds to an algebraic curve F of I K, J K equals zero. I K, J K, ISL to R invariants. Uh -huh. And similarly, it satisfies a fourth order differential equation, which is expressed in, in algebraic form F of P K, Q K is zero, where P K, Q K are GL to R invariants. So there are two algebraic curves naturally associated to every modular form. And in all examples that, we, uh, that we've done, that we've studied, this curve, the second curve, is always rational for some reason. Probably we haven't computed uh, uh, with sufficiently many examples. If we go for larger, uh, for congruent subgroups, gamma zero of n for larger n, maybe this will no longer be the case, but we haven't got any, a single example where this curve wouldn't be uh, rational. Okay, uh, and in the rest, I will just show you some examples. Remember the Eisenstein series E4. Uh, so it satisfies the following uh, fourth order OD, which is a cell to R invariant, all right? This is the fourth order OD. And this is the uh, invariant form, the same ODE written in terms of invariants, I4, J4. This subscript four means weight four. I4, J4, isl 2 r invariants of weight four, all right? Uh, so as you see, uh, it is quite a simple expression in terms of the invariants. And this defines, by the way, this is the equation of a singular elliptic curve. It's a nodal case, nodal, uh, cubic, because there is a double root in this polynomial, right? And there is also a fourth order ODE. If you if you write it in terms of E4, it will be quite messy, quite a long ODE. But in 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 terms of differential invariance, it's very simple. It's just this. All right? This is a fourth order differential equation for E4, where for P4 and Q4 substitute. Uh, um, differential invariants of, uh, that I showed before. Okay, E6, uh, differential equations for E6 uh, are quite long, uh, but if you write them in terms of the invariants, they're quite simple. Uh, so this is third order differential equation um, in terms of E6 and uh, I6 and J6. Uh, by the way, this equation defines a rational curve. It's uh, high degrees, degree six, but in fact, it's rational curve with singularities. 
And the fourth order of OD for E6 is also quite uh, longish if you write it explicitly, but in terms of the invariance, it's simple, right? It's just defined by quadratic relation among the invariants. Okay, so let me show you some more examples. Uh, modular discriminant, I have discussed this before. Uh, third order ODE for modular discriminant delta is this. And in terms of the invariance, it's this. It's this. All right, so it, uh, it's uh, defined by an, it's a, the, the equation of an elliptic curve, right? And the fourth order ODE is this one. We discussed it before. And in invariant form, it, it's just this. Q12 equals six. 12, I remember, I remember that 12 is the weight of delta. So this subscript 12 means the weight of the modular form. All right, so a few more examples. Uh, Jacobi theta constants. Jacobi theta constants also modular forms of weight one half. Okay, then non-classical modular forms on a, a special subgroup of SL2Z. So theta two, theta three, and theta four. These are the expansions. These are the expansions. Uh, so they are functions of tau. Tau is variable in the upper half plane. These are theta constants. Uh, it is known, well known, that all theta constants, all three of them, satisfy one and the same uh, third order equation, which was known to Jacobi. Jacobi derived this. Oops, sorry. Uh, Jacobi derived this uh, third order uh, ODE. In terms of the invariance, this ODE takes quite simple form. Also, all these three uh, theta constants satisfy a fourth order ODE, which is shown here. And its invariant form is uh, very simple. It's just this. Okay, a few more examples. Uh, uh, Eisenstein series E13. Uh, so this is a modular form of weight one on a congruent subgroup, gamma zero of three. And it's defined as follows. It's sum of uh, over all uh, points of the integer lattice, Z2 lattice, of these things, Q to this power. So it's a certain theta function, uh, all right? Uh, and its expansion is one plus six Q, six Q cubed and so on, right? Uh, this uh, uh, Eisenstein series satisfies a third order ODE, which is shown here, SL2 invariant. In invariant form, it has this expression and it satisfies a fourth order ODE, uh, this one. Uh, uh, in invariant form, it has this simple form. By the way, I mentioned before that ODEs for uh, modular forms may have non-generic solutions. For instance, let's take this fourth order ODE. Its generic solution is this thing, is this Eisenstein series, but it has non-generic solution. For instance, let's take F of tau just equals tau. Then F double prime is zero, F triple prime is zero, F triple prime is zero, F four primes is zero, uh, is zero. All right, so this is satisfied for a very simple solution, F of tau equals tau, All right? And this solution is of interest because uh, this ODE appeared in the classification of integrable Lagrangians of some kind. And uh, for F of tau equals, F of tau, the solution F of tau equals tau corresponds to a very meaningful and interesting example. So this ODE is, and by the way, this is typical. All these ODEs, they possess, they do possess non-generic rational solutions, which also fit us. Okay, and now let me show you the main example. Uh, the main example, uh, which is related to the modularity theorem. Probably, uh, uh, okay, I will not go to Jacobi forms. Uh, it will be just the last example. I will discuss. So uh, uh, let's take uh, the congruent subgroup gamma zero of 11. So let me remind you why 11. So if we take uh, a Hecke congruent subgroup gamma zero of n, 
and factor the upper half plane by gamma zero of n, you will get a, a curve, an algebraic curve of genus which depends on n. So this genus equals zero for n less than 11. The first time when uh, the genus of this factor equals one is when n equals 11. That's why I'm, I'm taking the first case when the factor of h by gamma zero of 11 has genus one, all right? In general, when n increases, the genus of this factor also increases, all right? And there are only finitely many values of n for which this factor has say genus zero, genus one, or genus two, there are only finitely many such values. So the genus generally increases. All right, so on this uh, subgroup, there is a cusp form of weight two, which is given by this particular expansion. There is a database uh, of this mod of modular forms, it's called LMFDB, which means L functions modular forms database, right? And this particular one, it has this label in this database. So this database contains a lot of no, uh, uh, so a lot of material uh, about modular forms and functions and so on, all right? Uh, so by trial and error, we found an ODE, a third order ODE for this F of tau. So you, how you do it? You compute I2 and J2, and then you try to find an algebraic relation uh, with undetermined coefficients, more or less. And you end up with this relation. So this is a third order OD for this function, right? This is a third order OD. Yeah, if you substitute invariance into here, it, it, it becomes like half a page uh, uh, along OD, uh, which is a cell to invariant. Um, uh, but uh, you can ask, uh, so obviously uh, uh, you can ask uh, Maple to calculate the genus of this curve. And it gives you genus one, the genus equals one. You can ask Maple to calculate its J invariant and it gives you this value. And this is exactly the same value as the J invariant of this curve. And this curve, I started with, when I discussed modularity theorem, I mentioned that this elliptic curve, it's by the way, it's a non-singular elliptic curve. It corresponds to this modular form via modularity theorem. On the other hand, we have just constructed another curve with the same, which also has genus one and the same J invariant. And it corresponds to our modular form F in a very explicit way, right? So, uh, you, you get F, you can calculate I2 and J2 in terms of F. So our, uh, this modular form F give explicit modular parameterization of this curve, all right? But this curve is obviously singular. It has singular points. If you resolve the singularities, so in fact, this curve, this, uh, this curve in terms of I2 and J2 is birationally equivalent to this one. In fact, if both curves have genus one and the same J invariant, they must be birationally equivalent, right? And here is uh, the birational map. Uh, so I2 and J2 are expressed in terms of X and Y by this formula. And there is also the inverse formula. So X and Y are expressed in terms of I2 and J2 by these formulas. This is the inverse transformation. <coughs> Also, you can calculate, let's go back. Uh, you can calculate holomorphic differential on this curve. Again, if you ask Maple, it gives you the answer. It gives you that there is a unique holomorphic differential on this singular curve of genus one. And this holomorphic differential is this, di2 over j2, right? This is the holomorphic differential. But I already mentioned, that for weight two modular forms, di2 over j2 is pi i f of tau d tau, where f is precisely this modular form, right? So uh, as it should be by the modularity theorem. So in other words, uh, uh, okay, I'm not an expert on uh, in number theory and the theory of elliptic curves, and in particular on this modularity theorem, but my understanding is 
that this map, uh, uh, which kind of, uh, this parameterization of elliptic curves over Q by modular forms is, uh, uh, how to say, it's the existence result. There is a map uh, from a modular, uh, from a factor of H by gamma zero of N to our curve gamma. There exists a modular parameterization, but it's not kind of explicitly given. You can construct it in each particularly given case, but there is no kind of universal recipe as far as I understand, right? But we have a universal recipe. You take a weight two modular form, uh, uh, you construct the corresponding algebraic curve explicitly. Right? And this algebraic curve, it, it comes automatically parameterized by this module form. And it is by rationally equivalent to the non-singular curve from the modularity theory, I would say, yeah? Okay, anyway, uh, 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 the same, uh, uh, remember this module form F of tau, uh, 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 it also satisfies a fourth order ordinary which is written here, you see it's quite huge, even in terms of the invariance, it's quite a complicated expression, uh, with integer coefficients, P2 and P2 are differential invariants, GL2 uh, GL2 differential invariants, and this curve is rational, it's a singular rational curve. As I said, in all examples that we have, for all modular forms that we studied, the fourth order OD always gives something rational, a rational algebraic curve, right? Uh, so I would suggest that I stop here. I have some material on Jacobi forms, but maybe uh, it makes, uh, uh, I, I better stop here. So what do you think? And maybe answer questions. Yes, thank you very much, Renia. Yeah. By the way, my next talk will be about uh, modular forms of many variables and how they are in the theory of integrable systems. Can you somehow characterize these third order and fourth order ODEs that are coming from these modular form constructions? Uh, they are cell to our invariant. Yeah, they are, but 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 uh, among uh, so uh, there are non-equivalent classes of of GL two R invariants equal, let's say, force order of these, right? Uh, so uh, I would say uh, uh, so. Let me maybe rephrase a uh, question. Uh, so given a modular form, it satisfies a third order and fourth order ODEs, and these ODEs correspond to algebraic curves. So can I characterize these algebraic curves? Is it is it the question? <laughs> Can I, can I, what can I say about these algebraic curves? Because the algebraic okay. curves are relations among the invariants. Right. So what are these relations? What are these algebraic curves? Unfortunately, I can't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I can't say. These are singular, so fourth order equation in all our examples is a, four, is a kind of a singular rational curve. For all, all third order equations are, uh, uh, singular, either rational or elliptic curves. We don't have any higher genus examples. So I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. So, sorry, you, you mentioned something in your abstract about semi-direct product of SL2 with Eisenberg. Will it be next time? Or? Uh, they, no, no, this, uh, these are Jacobi forms. I have oh. a few more slides on Jacobi forms, but uh, I, I decided because I I am already I, I I've been talking one hour, so probably it makes no sense. Uh, Maybe you will send the uh, yeah 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 it's on the archive. This uh, this semi-direct product it it's, uh, comes from Jacobi forms. Okay. Uh, it, it, actually, for the sort of the ODs, when you get elliptic curves, is there any restrictions for J-invariant? For J-invariant? Yes. Uh, what, uh, uh, so it can be, in fact, it can be uh, 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 any, uh, uh, it can be uh, any uh, elliptic curve, right? Any elliptic curve with rational, co with rational coefficients uh, comes from this construction. Right for a suitable modular form. 
So for a suitable modular form, third order ODE gives you a, an arbitrary elliptic curve with rational coefficients. Okay. It's barational class to be precise. It gives an arbitrary barational class. So, and so J invariant can be anything, I guess. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I don't know good, uh, 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 what is the value of a J invariant for a rational curve with integer coefficients. For, for an elliptic curve with rational coefficients. I'm actually not sure. Can it be anything? I don't know. No, it can't be anything, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not really restricted by. But the curve is not restricted. Any rational, any elliptic curve with rational coefficients can be obtained from this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Okay, then um, let's thank Jenia again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.